we good? <laughs> We're fine. All right. Uh, just a couple of things to start with, everybody. Um, as the president mentioned in uh, his remarks yesterday, uh, at his direction, Secretary Austin ordered the additional movement of some U.S. forces that were currently stationed in Europe to continue our support for NATO allies and the defense of the eastern flank. Uh, these forces, comprised of aviation element and some ground forces, will move within, inside the European uh, area of operations uh, to NATO's northeastern and southeastern flanks in the coming days, and we expect them to be in place later this week. Uh, they include an infantry battalion task force of approximately 800 personnel that will be moving from Italy to the Baltic region. Uh, it's a movement of up to eight F-35 strike fighters from Germany to several operating locations along the eastern flank. A battalion of attack aviation, specifically 20 AH-64 helicopters from Germany, again to the Baltic region, and an attack aviation task force, which is 12 AH-64 helicopters, will move from Greece to Poland. Uh, the additional personnel uh, are being repositioned to reassure our NATO allies, deter any potential aggression against NATO member states, and train with host nation forces. And of course, they'll report, continue to report to, to General Todd Walters, the commander of U.S. European Command. Uh, these moves are temporary. I want to stress that. They're temporary in nature, and they are part of the more than 90, now 90,000 uh, U.S. troops that are already in Europe that are both there on uh, rotational as well as uh, permanent orders. Uh, and, of course, as you know, the U.S. maintains significant numbers of combat-capable forces in Europe. Relatedly, U.S. Army Europe and Africa will be kicking off Exercise Sabre Strike 22 later this month. The exercise will run through March with approximately 13,000 participants from 13 countries. Sabre Strike has been held every two years since 2010. This is the next year for it. It is scheduled during uh, the wintertime uh, to help demonstrate the ability to operate in austere conditions. The Fifth Corps, Army Fifth Corps, will provide command and control for the exercise. And conducting Sabre Strike now, we believe, demonstrates that U.S. forces in Europe can simultaneously support ongoing operations and regularly schedule training without any degradation uh, in support to our NATO allies and, and partners. Training events like Sabre Strike are planned well in advance, and this one was, uh, and, and demonstrate that NATO allies and partners are, 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 are stronger together and through training and interoperability exercises get stronger together. Uh, lastly, I think you may have seen uh, that the Secretary did approve a couple of requests for National Guard support here in the Capital Region. He approved that request yesterday. Those requests came from uh, the D.C. government, um, uh, their man emergency management agency, as well as the U.S. Capitol Police. All told, among the two requests, it's about 700 guards personnel and about 50 vehicles. Uh, they are designed for traffic support uh, in anticipation of uh, potential uh, challenges to traffic here in the D.C. area uh, uh, with, we're, we're surrounding um, some, uh, some potential protest activity. Uh, I want to stress again that uh, that it's, it's a relatively small number here, about 700, uh, and uh, they will be supporting traffic support needs. That's, that's their goal. That's their mission. Uh, and with that, we'll take questions. Lita. Uh, John, the people are talking about this a potential uh, invasion by uh, Russia of, of a large scale being imminent. Can you talk about what the U.S. has seen today that may be different than what it has seen in recent days, why this has become sort of now imminent. Have you seen Russian troops move into uh, Luhansk and, and um, Dotesk? Have you seen them move into that Donbass region? And have you seen them move further into Ukraine beyond those two regions? Okay, a lot, lot there. Um, on the Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, as you've heard administrator administration officials say before, we do believe that that, that marks the beginning of an invasion. We, uh, we certainly uh, believe that Russian, additional Russian military forces uh, are moving into that region, not beyond that region that we have seen, but we can't confirm with any great specificity uh, the, the numbers and, uh, and what the formations are, what the capabilities are, uh, but we certainly believe that that's happening. Um, as for your larger question, uh, Lita, uh, without speaking to specific timing, because only Mr. Putin knows what the timing is here. Uh, what I would tell you is that we continue to see 
uh, him uh, uh, form his capabilities in such a way that that, that leads us to believe um, that uh, that we are potentially close to some sort of action. Uh, again, what that action is going to be, and exactly on what timeline, we, we can't be sure. Uh, but uh, but what we see is that um, Russian forces uh, continue to uh, assemble uh, closer to the border um, and uh, and put themselves in uh, uh, an advanced stage of readiness to to act uh, to to conduct military action uh, in in Ukraine again uh, at virtually uh, any time now we we believe that. Uh, that they are, um, they are, they are ready. I, I'll just put it, uh, leave it at that. They're, they're ready. Jen. John, there are reports of a chemical plant in Crimea that's been evacuated. This is the kind of uh, location that was described to us by uh, Secretary Blinken as a possible uh, stage provocation. Are you seeing reports of? any sort of preparations either for an attack on a chemical plant or what are what are you seeing? I, I don't have any specifics on that claim, but it is of a piece of the kinds of ridiculous claims that we have seen the Russians make in, in recent days of uh, alleged provocations or assaults and attacks unprovoked uh, on their on their people. Um, so again, no knowledge of this particular one, uh, but uh, but again, we've we've been seeing this over now recent days. These these claims of uh, whether they're acts of terror or acts of violence, uh, unprovoked uh, shelling of uh, uh, of Russian forces or, or Russian separatists. Uh, all again, that is of a piece of the playbook that we that we have seen the Russians use uh, time and time again. I, I have no specific knowledge about this particular report. But again, uh, it fits perfectly into the Russian disinformation playbook. Did the U.S. government help protect the Ukrainian government from this denial of service attack, the cyber attack? Did you help them with preparations for how to uh, rebut, re to get back online quickly after such an attack? So first, uh, I don't think we're in a position to attribute uh, these cyber disruptions these that you that you're talking about I assume you're talking about the various websites the government websites that, that were that were taken uh, offline um, what I would just tell you broadly speaking Jen is that uh, we, we have provided um, um, some cyber resilience uh, training and assistance to the Ukrainians um, and uh, I won't go beyond that in terms of uh, in terms of these specific attacks uh, again not in a position right now to attribute them to, to any one entity, I would just say that, again, this this is of a piece of a, a Russian playbook, which is to, to disrupt in cyberspace. Uh, let's see, anybody else? Jenny. Thank you, John. Uh, I have two questions on the Ukraine and, and, and linkage with Korea. And uh, if, Ru if Russia uh, uses nuclear weapons to invade Ukraine, what will the U.S. do? Secondly, uh, if Russia were to use nuclear weapons in this invasion, what would be the impact on the Korean Peninsula? Because there is a fear that North Korea will copy this. Any comment? Yeah, I'm going to avoid speculating here and getting into hypotheticals, particularly about the potential use, use of uh, nuclear weapons, Jenny. Um, what we've said all along, uh, two things. One, Mr. Putin has a lot of capability at, at his disposal right now. As I've said earlier, they are ready to go. Um, and number two, if he decides uh, to conduct uh, a, 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 a full-scale invasion here again, um, uh, bigger than what we've seen in just the last few days. This will be a war of choice. That He'll be doing so with, you know, with diplomacy and, and options still left on the table. Um, and it won't be bloodless. Uh, there will be suffering. There will be sacrifice. And all of that must and should be laid at his feet because he's doing this by choice. Uh, how he does this, when he does this, we don't know for sure. But if he does this, uh, th this will be a war of choice and totally 
um, unnecessary. And as for the impact on the on the region, I just I I, uh, I couldn't begin to to, to speculate. Um, nothing's changed, obviously, about our commitment to our our South Korean uh, allies. And we noted that the, the South Koreans uh, also came out publicly yesterday uh, with a statement of support for Ukraine. That was certainly noticed by the whole international community. Yeah, in the back there, Abraham. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, a couple parts to this question. You, you just described a lot of different forces moving to the eastern flank. Um, is there any consideration of those forces going under NATO command, and why not? <coughs> also, there's the word is temporary is, is pretty prominent there. Uh, is there a is there a time frame for temporary? And is there any talk yet of the, the NATO rapid response, those U.S. forces getting activated? Okay. Yep, there's a lot there. Uh, right now, they're going to be under the command of General Walters in his uh, U.S. European command hat. Um, I, I don't know of any changes to that. Uh, temporary, um, I, I don't have an exact time frame on this. I want to remind you that they were already in Europe. They're simply repositioning. Uh, elsewhere in, in Europe. I, I don't have a, a time frame on how long that repositioning is going to be, uh, except to say that uh, it'll be as long as we believe it's necessary and the, the host nations, the new host nations that will be uh, uh, hosting these, uh, the un these units are willing to, to continue to have them. So this will be a constant discussion uh, with each host nation that, that they end up in uh, about uh, where they go how long they stay, and what kind of training opportunities they're going to conduct. This is really all about reassuring allies and partners uh, and, and demonstrating that in tangible ways. On your – I lost your third question. Dang it. Rapid was, response for us. Oh, uh, that's a better question for, for, for NATO, Abraham. That's not a question for the United States. Um, that'll be up to the NAC to decide, North Atlantic Council to decide, not, not just the United States uh, unilaterally, of course. What I will tell you is that – that, uh, as you know, the secretary has put on a, a shorter uh, alert tether our contributions to the NRF, the NATO Response Force, uh, so they are more ready to go if called upon. So what? while I can't give you any sorts of, uh, of uh, timing or certainty about whether the NRF is going to be activated, what I can tell you with certainty that is it, if it is, our contributions to the NRF will be ready to go and will contribute fully. But they're still in the United States, correct? Correct. Yeah, Tony. Is there much discussion within the Pentagon or within the National Security Council about whether all of Putin's maneuvers and the force buildup is a grand game of brinksmanship and he's got no intention of invading? He just wants to show his, mu show his muscle, get the U.S. and NATO to commit to not entering, uh, letting Ukraine into the, into the alliance. In other words, a game of brinksmanship, bluffing, but not really an intent to invade. We have seen no indication of that, Tony. But, but let me ask you, though, it's been, has it been groupthink here, though? You're all thinking, just assuming he's going to do this? Or have you actually skeptically look at whether this is just a bunch of BS brinksmanship, albeit on a grand scale? Tony, we've been looking at this now for months, uh, and we've been talking to allies and partners for months. The secretary was just in Brussels last week meeting with all his counterparts in, in the alliance. Uh, it's not just the United States who is deeply concerned about the potential for uh, war in Ukraine now, that, that uh, other NATO allies feel the same way. We've, we've all been looking at this. I hope, uh, we all hope, that we're wrong about this. But every indication we have uh, is that he is poised to attack Ukraine again, and, uh, and this time with what could be uh, significant uh, military force. Um, I mean, we are talking about more than 150,000 troops that he has arrayed against that border. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, we believe that they are now at a state of readiness where uh, they could attack at any time. That's what we're seeing. And that's what we've been saying. Uh, we've been talking about this very openly now for weeks. We've seen Sadly, and unfortunately, no indication that he's willing to de-escalate, move those troops back home, and actually get to some sort of serious diplomatic solution. Every indication, rather, that we see is quite the opposite. Can I ask you a, quick, a China related question? Is there any indication that President Xi has given his tacit or explicit approval uh, to Putin <coughs> for, for a force, for an invasion? You recall there was speculation that an invasion wouldn't happen until the Olympics were over. The Olympics are over now. Any indication that China has given its wink and nod? Well, 
Well, I mean, I would point you back to the February 4th statement that uh, that she and put Putin puts out, which certainly we took as as tacit approval for what Mr. Putin uh, is doing. Uh, you could point also to uh, uh, concerning comments by the Chinese foreign ministry yesterday uh, that uh, made it clear that they weren't going to support any what they called unlawful unilateral sanctions against uh, Russia and then blame the United States for uh, contributing security assistance to Ukraine, somehow blaming us for this issue. No mention whatsoever in their statement about the 150,000 plus soldiers uh, and, the, and the threats that, uh, that uh, Mr. Putin has been uh, lobbying against Ukraine now for, for many weeks, including just, uh, just, uh, just yesterday. Um, it, it, um, I, I, we wonder, can it really be uh, the Chinese policy now uh, to support uh, separatist movements uh, over uh, over the sovereignty of nation states. That's that's an interesting twist, isn't it? Zoe. Thank you, John. Uh, is there any? Um, I, I would like to go back to the uh, uh, the movements of U.S. troops to the. Uh, Baltic states and to the eastern flank, is there any consideration uh, of sending more uh, U.S. troops uh, if there is an, uh, an invasion and on a permanent basis on this eastern flank of, the, of NATO? Uh, there's nothing, th th there's no expectation at this time, Sylvia, that, uh, that we're going to uh, move to more permanent basing uh, on NATO's eastern flank. Uh, we're, we're, what we're talking about now are, are short-term, temporary, rotational uh, uh, redeployments, if you will. As for your first question, whether there's, I, I assume what you're asking is, are we going to send more troops from the United States to NATO's eastern flank? And go, I have, I have no such announcements or or movements to speak of today. But as I have said. Repeatedly, uh, we're going to keep all options on the table. I'm not going to rule out that the secretary might want to consider that should there be a need. Uh, we're looking at this day by day. Uh, and just yesterday, as you saw, we, we did reposition inside Europe. And, and uh, uh, th there are lots of options available to us to continue to look for ways to, to reinforce that eastern flank. And, <clears throat> but this will be uh, uh, temporary. You don't <clears throat> think about changing your posture in case of an invasion? Right now, we're focused on reassuring the allies, um, and, uh, and we're going to be in constant contact with them and consultation about what that looks like and how you do that, uh, how you do that given the current tensions on the continent. Um, it's too early to tell whether any of this is going to lead to some other you know, longer-term posture changes. Uh, we, we certainly, we're just not at that point right now. Barbara. You mentioned uh, before that if this conflict breaks out, it would not be bloodless. So I assume that's also somewhat of a caution to Russia, that it would not be bloodless for them and their troops. Can you be any more specific as this is assessed? Or is the Russian military, to use the expression, really 10 feet tall? Or do you see some vulnerabilities for them here? So. Clearly, if he chooses war, he chooses violence, which means um, he's deliberately choosing uh, to put lives at, at danger, soldiers' lives, civilians' lives. And he's going to have to bear the responsibility for that. And I think, I would hope, uh, that, uh, that he understands that some of those lives at risk are going to be his soldiers' lives. And he's going to have to answer to Russian moms and dads about their soldiers that aren't making it back home alive or making it back uh, uh, w with injuries. Um, he's going to have to answer for that. Um, and as for the 10 feet tall, look, I, I, I think you know, getting into qualitative assessments here of militaries is, is probably not the... Uh, the best exercise uh, for me right now. Um, they have, as we've said for a long time, significant combined arms capabilities arrayed against Ukraine right now. And they are ready to go right now, should that be 
the way that Mr. Putin wants to go. Um, and we would obviously like to see that not happen. And we would like to see him de-escalate. We would like to see him make a better choice here, which we still think there's time to do, and de-escalate. Move those troops back to garrison. Uh, move them back home. Keep them safe and not pursue a, a war of choice uh, uh, totally on, on what is his whim. As we sit here today, are there, are there still active functioning channels of U.S. Russian military to military communications. Are you able to, is, you know, the secretary, the chairman, are you able to pick up the phone and will your counterparts talk to you? Well, I would point to conversations that we've read out uh, in just recent days. Uh, the secretary spoke with Minister Shoigu just a few days ago. Chairman Milley. Talking about right now. I, I know, I'm getting there. Chairman Milley has had many conversations with uh, General Grasimov, his counterpart, um, and we have seen no indication that those lines of communication between those two leaders are closed. Uh, I don't have any additional phone conversations to talk about today or to announce, but we have seen no indication that there won't be that communication sh should it be necessary. Court. How about a, a, more of like a tactical uh, line of communication? I, you know, I don't know if deconfliction is the right term to use here because there's not a U.S. military component to this. Like they're not going to theoretically right. be flying over the same skies. Or, right. or in this, but, but what about something that might de like deconflict tactically on the ground once Russia moves in? It seems that you know we keep hearing about the U.S. military moving more and more assets into that region. Mm -hmm. Is that the, is it appropriate for General Milley to be the one calling General Grasimov when we're talking about like potentially very quick mm -hmm. tactical moves on the ground? I don't think we're at a point right now where um, where that's needed, right? Because there hasn't been a large scale invasion yet uh, of Ukraine, and hopefully there won't be court. So hopefully there won't be any need for that kind of communication. But you get to a really good point, which is the potential uh, if he decides to go in big in Ukraine. Um, that puts Russian military forces right up against the eastern flank uh, of, Na of, of, uh, of NATO, his western flank. Um, and that's an eastern flank, by the way, that we're going to continue to reinforce and make more ready. And so you do get into a, a, a potential there for miscalculation uh, and miscommunication. We're just not there yet that we can speak to specific deconfliction mechanisms, and hopefully there won't be a need for that. Um, but, it, uh, but it does raise... A, a larger issue, your question does, of the potential for miscalculation here. And, and given the fact that this isn't, again, I know we talk about deconfliction, I, I think a lot of us think of Syria, but this, right. this is a very different situation. There's not U.S. military component inside the, the potential invasion area, Correct. right? Would it be more appropriate for DOD or General Milley or state? Like, what would that mechanism, who would be the one who would be responsible for establishing that mechanism? Yeah, again, we just, we're not at that point right now, Courtney. So it's, it's difficult to answer that question. And I'm not dodging it. it it's just we are, aren't at that point right now. I mean, um, so I, I'd rather not speculate about who would be in communications with whom. Um, and again, as at my answer to Barb, there hasn't, there's no indication that we've gotten that there still isn't the ability at the strategic level for leaders to talk. Jim. John, you talked about the, uh, to build on Selby's question, you talked about the F-35s and I guess 32 uh, Apaches. Well, it's not just an aircraft and a pilot. How many people are associated with that, with those moves? Yeah, all told, if you uh, if you added up, uh, you know, the, uh, the the infantry battalion that we talked about, that's about 800, and then there's about another 200 uh, crew, pilots, maintenance that would go with those aircraft elements that we talked about. So all told, uh, the president's announcement yesterday equates to about a thousand people. Again, I want to stress two things. They're being repositioned inside Europe. They're not coming from the states. And two, these are temporary moves. And if I could just uh, build on Courtney's question, doesn't General Walters in his NATO hat, can't he speak to uh, Grasimov? I would suspect yes, as Sakir, he certainly he certainly could. Uh, I, I know of no reason why he wouldn't be able to do that. Um, uh, General Grasimov is the chief of defense, so he is more appropriately General Milley's counterpart. Um, but I can't imagine that there would be a reason why, if uh, if General Walters wanted to speak to him, that he couldn't in in his NATO hat. Yeah. 
John, uh, based on given the fact that Russians have brought a variety of ca capabilities to the to the area, including cruise missiles, <coughs> ballistic missiles, do you still think that the arms provided by the United States would help Ukrainians to defend themselves against all these capabilities? Because we are providing, again, lethal and non-lethal assistance to Ukraine. Uh, they've expressed uh, their gratitude for that assistance. I would remind you that, well, a couple of things, $650 million just this year alone, um, and we're still in discussions with them about what kind of support uh, they might need going forward. Um, and uh, we're in constant consultation with them uh, about their needs and what we can provide. It's not just us. That's my second point. Other nations are as well stepping up uh, to provide uh, both lethal and non-lethal assistance to Ukraine. Let me go to the phones here. I haven't done that yet. Uh, let's see. Um, Mike Brest, Washington Examiner. Thanks for taking my question, Mr. Kirby. A little bit out of left field, uh, but the 90-day period uh, that General Michael Garrett had uh, to look into the Syria strike from 2019 expires this weekend. Would you tell or take the question? Uh, you know what? You broke up there, Mike. Uh, can you just repeat the last part of your question? Yeah. So the 90 day period for his investigation into the 2019 Syria strike expires this weekend. Could you provide any update or take the question? Uh, I know that he's uh, wrapping that up, Mike. I don't have a specific uh, timeline of when uh, when that's going to be uh, turned in and reviewed. Uh, I will take the question and we'll we'll see if we can't get you a better answer, Tom. Hi, John. Good afternoon. I have two questions: one on Ukraine and one on the guard deployment. Which would you like first? <laughs> <laughs> you uh, you can decide, Tom. Uh, the guard deployment is the easier one, perhaps. Um, uh, there's been reports of, from and complaints and concerns by the District of Columbia government and Capitol Police that they don't have the ability to remove trucks, tow trucks, in other words, to remove any trucks that impede traffic situations. Is there any Defense Department assets that could be made available to help them in this situation? You know, I, I, don't, uh, I don't really know, Tom. I mean, the, the request that we got was for some personnel and, uh, and 50 vehicles uh, to help with traffic flow. Uh, there's been no request uh, of the department for tow truck capability, and frankly, I'm not sure that we have a lot of that, to be honest with you. Um, um, I actually don't know how many tow trucks we own, but I don't think it's very many. So uh, again, we're focused on meeting the requirements that they laid forth for help. Uh, again, it was roughly 700 guardsmen and 50 vehicles. What's your second question? On, on Ukraine, uh, you've talked a lot, and others have talked about what the Russians are doing is out of their playbook. In other words, they're, they're they're, everything they're doing is sort of doing their playbook. Yeah. Yet the massive uh, uh, development of the forces on the border, the type of overall attack that's being projected possibly for Ukraine, that's not the blunderbuss approach they usually have taken if you look at Georgia and the Crimea and other areas. What playbook are they emulating for this possible attack on Ukraine? When we talk about the, the playbook, as you will, uh, we're, we're talking about the preparatory moves that we have seen them do in the past, and 2014 is a great example of that. And when we look at the kinds of pretextual things they were doing, it seems to me like they haven't updated their playbook in a long time because it's the same kind of stuff. It's claiming that they're the victims, creating false events or even not even creating events, but simply claiming that things happened that never did to paint themselves as the victims. As if Ukraine, which has never attacked anybody, is all of a sudden going to uh, spuriously attack Russia and threaten their national security when there's 150,000 plus troops along the border. I mean, it, it is ridiculous, but that is, that is exactly the kind of plays we've seen them run, the preparatory plays. Now, what, to your point, and it's a fair one, what we've seen them array against that uh, along the border, more than 150,000 uh, troops and significant, as I said, combined arms capabilities, that is something we haven't seen them do before. Where do you think they've gotten that tactic from? that strategy from, since they've never employed it in their past adventurism? That is a great question for Vladimir Putin. I mean, I, 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 I'm not trying to dodge the question, but like I, Russian accent. I don't, I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I, we don't know. I mean, we can't possibly get inside his head to figure out, uh, you know, why he's doing it the way he's doing it. And again, Tom, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, it doesn't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. He can make another choice. Of all the options he has available to him, 
The one he still has is diplomacy if he chooses, and we just haven't seen an indication to do that. Mike. Hey, John, any, uh, two questions. First off, any idea whether or not Russia has also used the Wagner Group mercenaries as part of this invasion force, or is it, or is it strictly sort of mainline Russian army troops? I have not seen any indications of that. I, I can't. I, I, nothing, anything like that. I, I haven't seen indications of the Wagner Group being used, but um, again, that's really, um, that might be a level of detail we, we, we don't have. Okay. Also, uh, to go back a little bit in history, the Soviet Union conquered Hungary in 56, rolled through Czechoslovakia in 68. The U.S. complained and uh, made a lot of noise, but nothing really happened. What's to, how will this turn out different from what's already happened in the past with their satellite, their former satellite countries? I was a history major at the University of South Florida, but I don't know that I can answer that one. Um, well, let me just put it this way. What we hope happens is that he de-escalates uh, and, and this war of choice doesn't occur. It's difficult, if he, if he chooses to go ahead, and again, every indication is that he will. Um, it's the one thing any student of war will tell you is it's unpredictable once it starts. You know, it's, it's the old adage, I think it was Eisenhower, right? It, it, no plan survives first contact. Uh, it, it's difficult to know where this will go. What we believe is that it will involve significant casualties uh, and, and, and destruction. Um, and um, that it will only cause instability on the European continent rather than the stability that, uh, that uh, I think most of the world and certainly the West wants to see. Where it goes beyond that, I just don't know, Mike, because we don't know really what, what he has in mind here. Um, I mean, he's pretty much, in, in terms of military a action, that's what I mean. If you look at his speech... He was pretty clear, wasn't he, uh, about the, the disdain he has for Ukrainian sovereignty um, uh, and the false claim that you know, you, Russia created Ukraine. I mean, there's a, it, it's pretty obvious that, um, as, our, as the Ukrainian foreign minister said just when he was here, that, that, uh, that Putin wants to uh, erase uh, Ukraine as a, as a nation state. What that ends up looking like long term is, is difficult to know. And again, at the risk of sounding like I'm dodging and I'm not, I, I truly don't know the answer to your question. It's a good one. And I don't know anybody could know that. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way. It, it just doesn't have to be that way. He can choose a different path here, which is still open to him. And that's what I think all of us would like to see him do. Um, I get time for a couple more. Yeah, go ahead. A country is invading another country just because that country wants to be part of an alliance that the United States is leading, like NATO. Isn't that an indirect threat to NATO and the United States national security at the same time? Well, pr prominently, it's a threat to the Ukrainian people. And I think, again, if you go back and look at his speech, uh, and we, certainly he's groused about potential NATO membership for Ukraine, no doubt about it. But, uh, but he laid out uh, an even more sweeping uh, uh, alternative reality uh, in his speech, uh, that it isn't just about whether or not NATO, NATO, you know, NATO uh, Ukraine joins NATO. Um, and uh, as for whether it further threatens NATO, I think that remains to be seen. Clearly, uh, we are making it very obvious that we take our obligations to NATO seriously. That's why we're sending these additional forces. That's why we're bolstering our allies. That's why Secretary Austin was in uh, Europe uh, just last week to deliver that message um, so that Mr. Putin knows, and quite frankly, our allies know too, uh, what President Biden said. We will defend every inch of NATO territory. Again, we don't want to see it come to that. But if it does come to that, the United States will be ready. Okay. You are really saying that the open door policy, you are stick to the open door policy of NATO. It is, up, that, it is up to the alliance and the nation state in question to determine future membership. It is not something that Mr. Putin gets to veto, period. Okay. Thanks, everybody.